oppose it. No, I, I think I would, I would still oppose it, but my point is that this one doesn't have any age limit, and so it makes it less tolerable the, the, you know, the, the more open-ended it is. And so I think, you know, people will fall on different places. And just a minute or so left in this hearing, you can see the rest of it at cspan.org. The U.S. Senate is about to gavel in this morning, beginning with general speeches. At 10.30, senators will take up the judicial nomination of Jane Kelly to be a federal judge on the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. At about 11, they'll consider the nomination of Sylvia Burwell to head the Office of Management and Budget. Both of the, those will get votes at about noon Eastern today. And then lawmakers will return to work on an online sales tax bill. And now the live coverage of the U.S. Senate here on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of your great mercy have promised to supply all our needs, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and bring us into the joy of abundant living. Today, give our senators the gifts of wisdom and understanding, of knowledge and judgment, so that those held captive will enjoy again the freedom and the peace of your providential love. Help us to show our gratitude to you with words and actions of affirmation. Tune our minds to the frequency of your spirit as we dedicate this day to serve you. And Lord, we ask you to bless our Capitol Police who risk their lives for freedom each day. We pray in your gracious name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., April 24, 2013, to the Senate, under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Richard Blumenthal, a senator from the state of Connecticut, to perform the duties of the chair, signed Patrick J. Leahy, President Pro Tempore. Mr. President. Majority Leader. Mr. President, I appreciate very much always the chaplain's prayer, but I especially want to recognize the last line or two of his prayer today where he indicated that he wanted a special blessing on the Capitol Police. I'm happy that the Sergeant Arms was here when that prayer was being um, given because the chaplain is right. Every day the Capitol Police protect us, that is, senators and staff, but also the millions of visitors who come to this massive complex every year. 
we see them standing there at, at guard, watching the doors, and we need to do that because just a few years ago we had some madman <clears throat> crash through the house side and kill two police officers. We see that things have gotten more difficult since then. Uh, we have uh, people standing with automatic weapons. We, we have bomb squads. We have these dogs that do work with us so well. We have people who are in bicycles. But I, with the appropriation process coming soon, I hope, uh, we have to make sure that we supply the Capitol Police with the tools and materials and equipment they need to continue doing their job. Is it inconvenient for people coming here and for us on occasion? The answer is yes. But they're doing that for us, for the people that come to this building. So uh, once again, I acknowledge the good chaplain. I appreciate his remarks on behalf of the people who protect us here every day. <clears throat> Following the leader remarks, the Senate will be in the morning business until 10.30. Republicans will control the first half, majority of the final half. Following that morning business, Senate will proceed to executive session to consider the nomination of Jane Kelly to be a United States Circuit Judge for the Eighth Circuit and the nomination of Sylvia Burwell to be Director of the Office of Management and Budget. So at noon, there'll be up to three roll call votes, confirmation of Kelly and Burwell, and adoption of motion to proceed to the Marketplace Fairness Act. <clears throat> Ms. President, yes. 788 is due for its second reading. Clerk will read the title of the bill. S-788, a bill to suspend the fiscal year 2013 sequester and establish limits on war-related spending. I would object to any further proceedings with respect to this bill at this time. Objection is heard and the bill will be placed on the calendar. Mr. President, I've had, I had a number of meetings yesterday with Democratic and Republican proponents of the Marketplace Fairness Act. This is a piece of legislation that is overwhelmingly supported by Democrats and Republicans. The presiding officer, I appreciate his remarks um, yesterday and on behalf of this legislation. Succinctly, what this legislation would do is level the playing field between online sellers and brick and mortar retailers. Mr. President, as everyone knows, we've had a lot of problems with the economy. But in Nevada, we've been hit really hard. We, we led the nation for 20 years with a vibrant economy. In the last four or five years, it has been difficult. We're doing better now, but we're not doing great. And it really, for lack of a better description, uh, I was going to say break my heart. I'm not sure that's proper, but I feel very, very bad. When I drive in Reno and Las Vegas and see these little strip malls with four lease signs, they would not be for lease if they had the ability to compete with these online sellers. And as indicated uh, yesterday on a number of occasions in presentations I heard made, people come to the people who pay money for brick and mortar, and they'll find a pair of shoes, they'll find a coat they like, or whatever else, and they immediately walk out of there and go online and don't pay the sales tax. That prevents that business from succeeding. So the reason I mention this, Mr. President, today, we could finish this legislation today on Wednesday and move on to other bipartisan legislation. Now, we have a small number of senators who are holding this up. Stalling, Mr. President, this has 50 Democratic votes and at least 25 Republican votes. I know many of my Republican colleagues want to attend, and I, I think that's appropriate. I wish I could. The opening of the Bush Library in Texas. Unfortunately, there are centers who are playing procedural games. It's going to prevent that from happening. There is, I don't say this often, there is no chance they can prevail. We have three states basically holding up this legislation. And for people to talk, you're coercing us to do something. We're coercing those states to do nothing. Zero. Nothing. We're just trying to make the playing field 
level. So, Mr. President, I want everyone to understand just a handful of senators are preventing us from doing our work. And we are going to finish this legislation this week. I know this sounds like uh, me uh, crying wolf, but this may be the time the, the wolf's really coming. Because, Mr. President, we have a bipartisan bill we have to move to next work period. It's the WERDA, <coughs> Water Resource Development Act, supported by one of the most liberal members of this Senate, Barbara Boxer, and one of the most conservative members, Senator Vitter. They've worked out a bill. It's been reported out of their committee. It's on the calendar right now, and we're going to move to that. In addition to that, we have another bipartisan bill that's in the wings of coming out, agriculture bill. And we need to complete those bills next work period because we have to get to immigration. So everyone understand, this is not crying wolf. We are going to finish this bill. I spoke yesterday to Senator Enzi, who has worked on this bill for 11 years. I spoke to my good friend, and certainly Mike Enzi is my good friend, because I don't mean to... Uh, choose favorites here, Lamar Alexander. They both said we've got to finish this bill this week. And we're going to do that. When I have requests from Dick Durbin and my Republican friends to move forward on this bill, we're going to move forward on it. And if we have to be here Friday and Saturday, I'm telling everybody, we're going to finish this bill. We have a three-week three work period next time. And we have to jam in that word and hopefully the Ag Bill so we can move before July 4th and finish the immigration bill, which is going to take a, quite a bit of time. We have too much to do when we return from our in-state work period, and I have a lot to do. I've got a uh, conference. That I, I'm going to do some things there with Eric Cantor. We don't do things together very often, but we're going to talk about um, some things that people want us to talk about. I would really like to be able to do that. It's not here in Washington. And I, if I have to put that off, it would be a shame for me and Eric Cantor, and I think the people are putting on the conference. But if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. And I want to go home. Um, so we're going to finish this bill. Mr. President, I'm going to read um, from one of the world's leading newspapers, an editorial. It says, budget cuts, comma, minus the inconvenience. Headline, Republicans encourage a sequester affecting the poor, but they're furious about labor delays, about travel delays, I'm sorry. Here's what it says. I'm not uh, editorializing. I'm just telling you what they put in this newspaper editorial today. On Monday, after the sequester cuts forced the Federal Aviation Administration to begin furloughs for air traffic controllers, delays began to be built up at airports around, around the country. Travelers had to wait, but nothing delayed Republicans from scurrying away from all responsibility. Speaker John Boehner started using the Twitter hashtag Obama flight delays the latest effort in his party's campaign to blame all the pain of the sequester on the Obama administration while claiming all the credit for the effect on reducing the deficit. Why is President Obama unnecessarily delaying your flight? It's a quote from Eric Cantor, House Majority Leader, wrote in a message on Twitter. If the President wanted to, Republicans said, he could easily cut somewhere else and spare travelers any inconvenience. As it happens, the sequester law is clear in requiring the FAA and most other agencies to cut their programs by an even amount. That law was foisted on the public after Republicans demanding spending cuts in exchange for raising the debt ceiling in 2011. Since then, the party has rejected every offer to replace the sequester with a more sensible mix of cuts and revenue increases. Mr. Boehner is so proud of that strategy that he recently congratulated his party for sticking with the sequester and standing up to the present demands for tax increases. 
But drastic cuts in spending carry a heavy price. Republicans certainly don't want voters they care about, including business travelers and those who can't afford to fly on vacation, to feel it. They continue to claim that the $85 billion in this year's sequester can be covered by eliminating fraud, waste, consultants, and an inevitable grant to some obscure science or art project. And of course, to programs for the poor. You don't see any Republican hashtags blaming the President for cutting housing vouchers to 140,000 low-income families, which has begun. These vouchers are given by cities to families on the brink of homelessness, and about half of them go to families with children. There aren't any hungry tweets about the 70,000 Head Start slots to be eliminated, which is forcing some school districts to distribute these valuable services by lottery. Or about the cuts to VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America. Now this is an editorial, Mr. President, where your presiding officer's colleague, Rockefeller, this wealthy man with this great name, as a young man, went to West Virginia and fell in love with the poor because he was VISTA volunteer and never left. And it's now here in the United States Senate. So, skip the editorial. I'm sorry about that. Um, or about the cuts to VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America, which is hurting the program that performs anti-poverty work in many states. Or the 11% cut in unemployment benefits for millions of jobless workers. The voiceless people who are the most affected by these cuts can't afford high-priced lobbyists to get them an exception to the sequester, the way the agricultural lobby was able to fend off a furlough to meat inspectors, which might have disrupted beef and poultry operations. And what was cut in order to keep those inspectors on the job? About $25 million from a program to provide free school breakfast. As bad as the sequester was, it is being made worse by these special interest demands for exceptions as well as politically motivated attempts to deflect the responsibility for pain. The maneuvering shows the futility of trying to reduce the deficit with crude and arbitrary cuts. Both Senate Democrats and the White House have proposed budget plans that replace the sequester with a much better mix of spending cuts and revenue increases. On Tuesday, the Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid proposed replacing the sequester for five months with unspent money for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, Mr. President, that's what one of America's major newspapers said today, that millions of people will have the opportunity to read. The sequester was designed as a tool to bring Democrats and Republicans together to reduce the deficit in a responsible way. By now, we can all see that didn't work. And we can see that the sequester's costs far outweigh its savings. As has indicated in this editorial, these across-the-board cuts will cost this year 750,000 jobs, three quarters of a million jobs. They'll cost us investments in education that keep America competitive. They'll cost millions of seniors, children, veterans, and needy families the safety net that keeps them from descending into poverty. Most of the headlines are focused on the hours the sequester has cost travelers in airports across the nation. The frustration and the economic effects of these delays should not be minimized. But the sequester could also cost the country and humankind a cure for AIDS, Parkinson's disease, or cancer. These arbitrary cuts have decimated funding for medical researchers seeking cures for diabetes, epilepsy, hundreds of other dangerous and debilitating diseases. The National Institutes of Health has delayed or halted vital scientific projects and reduced the number of grants it awards to research scientists. Thousands of research scientists will lose their jobs in the next few months, and research projects that can't that can't go on without adequate staffing will be canceled altogether. At Ohio State University, Mr. President, which is known for more than a good football or basketball team, is also one of the premier research centers in America. And at Ohio State University, grants for cancer research and infectious disease control have been axed. They're over with. At the University of Cincinnati, which is the forefront in research on strokes, a leading cause of death in the United States, scientists are bracing for similar cuts. Vanderbilt University and University of Kentucky are accepting fewer science graduate state students because of funding reductions. At Wright State University, scientists researching pregnancy-related disorders such as a word I can't pronounce, but it's spelled P-R-E-E, 
C-L-A-M-P-S-I-A, will lose their jobs. Boston University has laid off lab scientists, and research laboratories in San Francisco have instituted hiring freezes and delayed the launch of important studies. And grants to some of Harvard University's most successful research scientists were not renewed because of the sequester. The research that I've talked about here today, and it's only a few of them, saves lives and saves misery. These scientists are looking for the next successful treatment for Alzheimer's or the next drug to treat high cholesterol. But they might never get the chance to complete their groundbreaking work or make their life-saving discoveries because of these short-sighted cuts. Mr. President, we've seen these devastating impacts on these arbitrary budget cuts. Now it's time to stop them. And be prepared, everybody. The House is now working on another bill because we have the debt ceiling coming soon. They're working on another bill to make it even more painful for the American people. Last night, I introduced a bill that would roll back the sequester for the rest of this year. Just like the editorial indicated, it's something we should do. The bill would give Democrats and Republicans time to sit down at the beginning at the negotiating table and work out an agreement to reduce the deficit in a balanced way. And it wouldn't add a penny to the deficit. It would use of savings from winding down the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq to prevent the cuts that will harm our national security and our economy. Before Republicans dismiss these savings, I should recall that 235 Republicans voted to use these funds to pay for the Ryan Republican budget. They didn't consider it a gimmick when it served their own purposes. We can stop the flight delays and the pink slips. We can stop the devastating cuts to programs to protect low-income children, homebound seniors, and homeless veterans. And we can stop the cuts to crucial medical research. But Democrats can't do it without Republicans' help. Republicans overwhelmingly voted for these painful, arbitrary cuts. And Republicans bear responsibility for their consequences. Remember, these cuts came about because of the debt ceiling. They refused to move on until these devastating cuts came about. And Republicans bear responsibility for their consequences, from travel delays to cuts to vital research programs. Now Republicans must accept that they have an obligation to cooperate with us to help stop these draconian cuts and mitigate, mitigate the consequences. Mr. President, I ask consent that uh, the leader time not count against the hour that was set aside for morning business. Without objection. Mr. President, Republican leader. <clears throat> Something truly remarkable happened in the Senate last night. It was sort of late in the day. So for those who missed it, here's a little recap. Late yesterday afternoon, the majority leader handed us a hastily crafted bill and then asked if we could pass it before anybody had seen it. Apparently, someone on the other side realized they had no good explanation for why they hadn't prevented the delays we've seen at airports across the country this week. So they threw together a bill in a feeble attempt to cover for it. It's really pretty embarrassing. It actually proposes to replace the president's sequester cuts with what's known around here as OCO. I know this isn't something that will be familiar to most viewers, so let me borrow an explanation provided by Senator Joe Lieberman in a letter he signed with Dr. Coburn just last year. Here's what Senator Lieberman said about OCO. The funds allocated for OCO, or war savings, are not real, and every member of Congress knows this. The funds specified for overseas contingency operations in future budgets are mere estimates of what our nation's war's cost may be, may be, in the future. And since it's likely that future OCO costs will be significantly less than the placeholders in the Congressional Budget Office estimates, it is the height of fiscal irresponsibility to treat the difference between assumed and actual OCO costs as a savings, a savings to be spent on other programs. Let me read that last part again. It is the height of fiscal irresponsibility to treat the difference between the assumed 
and actual OCO costs as a savings to be spent on other programs. This is from the man who was once the Democratic nominee to be vice president. So there's bipartisan consensus that this thing we call OCO is a fiscally irresponsible gimmick, a gimmick. The director of the Concord Coalition has called it, quote, the mother of all gimmicks, end quote. The president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget called it a, quote, glaring gimmick, end quote. So whether OCO is the mother of all gimmicks or just a glaring one, everybody other than the majority leader evidently agrees on one thing. It's the height, the height of fiscal irresponsibility. Now, just as important as what the majority leader's proposal is, however, is what it isn't. It isn't the tax increase, and that's actually news. The majority leader is clearly ditching the president on this issue. As you may recall, the president has said he'd only consider replacing the sequester with a tax hike. And whatever you want to say about OCO, it's not a tax hike. It's borrowed money that will have to be repaid later. Still, it doesn't punish small businesses like the president's proposals would do, so this is, in a sense, big news. It represents a significant break from the president's favorite approach on this issue. As I said yesterday, the president rejected the flexibility we proposed on the sequester for obvious political reasons. He wanted these cuts to be as painful as possible for folks across the country and to provide an excuse to raise taxes to turn them off. Well, it's simply not working. Even his own party is starting to abandon him on this issue. But the broader point is this. Even without the flexibility we propose, he already has the flexibility he needs to make these cuts less painful. He's got it right now. He should exercise it. I also think we should all acknowledge that there's now a bipartisan agreement that tax hikes won't be a replacement for the sequester. But the real solution, as I've said, is for the administration to accept the additional flexibility we'd like to give them to make these cuts in a smarter way and to get rid of wasteful spending first. I mean, surely in $3.6 trillion that we're spending this year, we can find a way to reduce the spending we promised the American people we would reduce a year and a half ago when the Budget Control Act was passed and do that in a sensible way. That's what we've consistently said. There's more flexibility in the law right now. We'd be happy to give the president even more uh, to achieve the cuts that we promised the American people we would achieve. Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. The Majority Leader. Remember, Ryan, Congressman Ryan, Chairman of the Budget Committee, used the same, uh, when used OCO to reduce the, I'm sorry, let's start over. Congressman Ryan, when he came up with one of his budgets, used these overseas contingency funds to balance his budget. Now, Mr. President, let's, let's uh, Madam President, let's not even worry about, for the purpose of this conversation, overseas contingency fund. Let's just talk about the war in Afghanistan. So what my friend is saying, it's okay to borrow money for the war in Afghanistan, but not to use those same monies to reduce the pain that's being felt all over America today. Even Joe Scarborough on Morning Joe, a former Republican congressman from Florida, said today he can't believe that the pain is being felt all over America today and no one is concerned about the war in Afghanistan. Does anyone think we're going to be fighting in the war in Afghanistan five years from now? Ten years from now? That's, that's the money that people are trying to protect. I hope not. For the sake of my children and grandchildren, I hope we're not still fighting in Afghanistan five or ten years from now. We're asking you to take a few dollars of the $650 billion that's there. Billion dollars. To relieve the pain we're feeling now for five months. That's it. I think it's really unfair that uh, it would be 
so easy to turn the sequester around and allow us to do something for a long term to take care of this issue. But no, the Republicans like the pain. They like the pain. One Republican senator came here last night and said, well, why don't we eliminate, uh, take the money from the construction fund? He said, why don't we take it from essential air service? That dog has been here and fought lots of times. That has been stripped bare, Madam President. And these, as I indicated in my opening statement, the reason marks are supposed to be fair and equal. You can't jimmy things around. It's the same amount of money. And the Republicans saying, well, same amount of money, but give more pain to somebody else than the other. Just balance it out. The pain is here. It can't be balanced out. Madam President. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will be in a period of morning business until 10.30, with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each, with equal time divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees, with the Republicans controlling the first half. Senator from Indiana. Uh, Madam President, uh, I rise today as a member of both the Senate Appropriations Committee on Transportation and as a member of the Commerce Committee to discuss what I believe is a shocking display of mismanagement and incompetence by the leadership of the Department of Transportation and the Federal Aviation Administration. The Federal Administration Aviation says that the sequester will result in as many as 6,700 delays per day. And to put this in context, in the worst weather day in 2012, we had 2,900 flight delays, so the FAA's projected 6,700 delays per day would more than double the worst day in 2012. To me, Madam President, this is a disturbing evidence of both the Department of Transportation and the FAA's lack of planning leading up to what we all knew was going to take place, and in fact, a law signed by the president. We've known for a year this may happen. The president signed it into law. We are now many months down the line, and the FAA comes along and says, oh, we just need to let you know just a few days ago that, by the way, uh, we're going to implement this part of the sequestration. This across-the-board furlough is especially surprising that given previous announcements, that their guiding principle during this sequestration would be implementing a plan that, let me quote, maintains safety and minimizes the impact to the highest number of travelers. So announcing three days or so before they implement this plan that potentially results in as much as 6,700 delays per day that minimizes the impact of the highest number of travelers? This is disingenuous. It's mismanagement at its worst. It's incompetence at its worst. It's a failure to do what every agency has been required to do. And that is planned for this. And now that it has been in law for several months, there is no excuse for simply saying, oh, we didn't have time to put this in place, and so this is what we're going to do. Now, I voted against sequestration because it treats every federal program on an equal basis, regardless of its necessity, its effectiveness, uh, its essential nature, versus a lot of things that are done around here that consume a lot of taxpayers' money that even shouldn't be done, but certainly don't rise to the level of essential functions of the federal government. Clearly, keeping our skies safe and getting our passengers from point to point is an essential function. We need those air traffic controllers, and the plan that has put forth by the FAA flies in the face of their own judgment and their own statements in terms of what they needed to do. And instead of furloughing 47,000 employees and causing significant delays for travelers, they should have been seeking reductions elsewhere. We tried to give 
these essential agencies the flexibility necessary to do so. Unfortunately, the president did not support that effort, and the majority party here in the Senate did not support that effort, and therefore they have no reason to point their fingers over here and say, oh, well, sequestering is so terrible. Sequestration is so terrible. Uh, and that we never should have been in this place in the first, uh, in this position in the first place. The FAA, just for the record, could have considered cutting back on the $541 million it spends on consultants. In other words, those that have been hired to work at the FAA um, need to spend, uh, can't do the job themselves, so they need to spend uh, $541 million to hire outside consultants and the $2.7 billion it spends on non-personnel costs. But instead, they, instead of looking at how to better manage their own administration, they turn to furloughing up to 10% of the air traffic controllers, creating up to 6,700 delays per day. And then they said they hadn't had time to work this out. Hadn't had time, they've had months worth of time since the law was signed. And how about the time that is now wasted as people stand in airports for three and four hours waiting to board their plane and the disruption? And this is in good weather. And so that, that is in itself a lame excuse that the FAA has put forward. I did not vote for the sequestration. I thought, as I said before, uh, it was an inadequate way to deal with the necessary need to cut spending here. But let's cut out the less than functional. Let's cut out the, well, we'd like to do that, but can't afford to do that right now, and focus on the essential services and give them the opportunity to manage that. And clearly, FAA and the Department of Transportation have not management. It's incompetence. Congress was only informed just days ahead of time, and so it's been difficult for us to react, and this kicked in to the surprise of the airlines and it's kicked into the surprise of Congress. But clearly, um, what we have learned that it, it, despite a year of advance warning uh, and then refusing to analyze all possible alternatives to minimize impacts to the traveling public, uh, it appears it, it's hard to come to any other conclusion that this is a politically motivated decision to inflict as much pain on Americans as possible in an effort to make the case that sequestration never should have taken place in the first place. That a 4% cut across the board out of the FAA budget uh, is simply something they can't manage. In other words, asking them to do what they did in 2010 with the money that was allocated to them then, no, we can't do that now. This is 2012. Uh, 2013, and we need this extra money, and we need these hundreds of billions of dollars to continue to hire consultants. And don't ask us to make the kinds of decisions that every business in this country has had to make over the last four or five years in this uh, malaise of an economic uh, growth following a, a recession that has taken place. Uh, don't ask us to do what every family's had to do. We're the government. We're the federal government. And uh, how dare you impose a 4% cut on what we do? We need to increase that every year because we need to keep hiring more and pay more consultants, and we're not capable of managing. It's just shocking. I hope the president will understand that uh, if he wants effective, efficient government, he's going to have to hire effective, efficient management. He's have to, going to have to give them the instructions to do what every business in America has had to do during this time of, of difficult and slow, a difficult economy and slow economic growth. So I think we ought to take a very close look at the kind of decisions that have been made at the Department of Transportation, the lack of competent management, and uh, the mismanagement of taxpayers' money. This administration needs to step up to the plate and take some accountability. The president, as I said, created and signed into law the sequestration policy. His administration has known for more than 12 months that this policy was imminent, and they have done nothing to prepare effectively. Mr. President, our, Madam President, our country is a long way from getting our spending under control, so it's time the administration stops looking for excuses and starts managing its budget effectively. With that, I yield the floor. <coughs> Madam President. Senator from North Dakota.
Thank you, Madam President. I rise this morning to introduce legislation. The legislation is the Dependable Air Service Act. It is a very simple, straightforward solution uh, to the issue of the furloughs of air traffic controllers, and I'd like to take just a few minutes to describe it. It's bipartisan legislation. I'd like to start out by thanking my uh, co-sponsors, the lead co-sponsor, Senator, Senator Amy Klobuchar of uh, Minnesota, uh, but also uh, Senator John Cornyn of Texas, uh, Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, Senator Kelly Ayotte, Senator uh, Risch of Idaho, and also uh, Senator Jean Shaheen of New Hampshire. So as you can see, it's bipartisan legislation. These are original co-sponsors on the bill with me, and we'll have more. We're talking to others. And as I said, it's a very <clears throat> simple, straightforward solution, I believe, to this uh, issue that we face of uh, delays in our airports across the country because of the furloughs to air traffic controllers. What the bill does is it says uh, to the administrator of the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, uh, Administrator Huerta, that you can use uh, dollars within your budget, move them around as you need to move them around, and that that's what you need to do is move dollars around within your budget so that you don't have to take $206 million out of the salary line of the air traffic controllers, and you can decide what reduction you can make in those salaries and what level of furloughs you can make to air traffic controllers, but still maintain air service on an on-time basis. So we have dependable on-time air service uh, across this country for our citizens. Further, it provides that if for any reason that the FAA administrators, administrator within his budget can't fully accomplish that, then the Secretary of Transportation, Ray LaHood, can work with him and utilize funds within the Department of Transportation budget. It provides the authority, quite simply, to move the dollars around within the DOT, Department of Transportation budget, gives the Secretary that authority to make sure that uh, they don't furlough more, effort, more air traffic controllers than are needed to keep our air uh, flights on time, to keep service, of course, safe and dependable so that the traveling public can know that their flights are going to be on time. The FAA is furloughing, uh, they've announced they're furloughing about 1,500 air traffic controllers, which is about 10% uh, of their to total air traffic controller workforce. That's to save 206 million of the roughly 630 to 640 million that FAA is reducing uh, under sequestration. Now, they have the authority uh, to move 2% of their operating budget without congressional approval, and they have authority to move up to 5% of their operational budget around with uh, congressional approval, which means coming to the Appropriations Committee and getting approval to move up to that 5%. What FAA Administrator Huerta has said is that that is not sufficient amount uh, to make the adjustments that, that he needs to make within the FAA budget to address uh, the furlough issue. So what we're saying, or what this bill quite simply does, is it says, look, you can move the dollars as you need to within your budget. You have the flexibility, you have the authority to do that. Do that, and if for any reason that isn't sufficient, then Secretary LaHood can backstop that through, do, uh, through uh, the Department of Transportation dollars. Now, just to put this into perspective, the uh, total budget for the Department of Transportation is $72 billion, $72 billion. Uh, and the total cuts throughout DOT, which includes the FAA, uh, under sequestration is about one billion. One billion. The FAA is taking $637 million of that reduction. And of course, the real issue that we're dealing with here in terms of flight delays is that about 206 million comes out of the air traffic controller salary line. So what we're saying is, look, make some reductions, find some economies, do what you can within air traffic controller line, just like you're doing across the budget, and we should all be doing. The federal government has a huge deficit. We have a huge debt. We have got to find ways to reduce spending. So we all are in this together, and we have to find ways 
on a sensible, common sense basis that minimizes the impact to the public, we have to, with that approach, find savings. So find the savings that you can in terms of how many air traffic controllers you can truly furlough, and then move the dollars that you have uh, to make sure that we do not impact the traveling public. Uh, again, this is a bipartisan bill. This is a simple, straightforward solution to the issue, and we need to do it. We need to do it. On Monday, reports are that there were 1,200 flights across the country delayed. And in airports in New York, in Dallas, and in Los Angeles, some of those flights were up to several hours. What FAA has indicated that up to 6,700 flights a day out of the roughly 23,000 plus flights a day may be delayed because of these air traffic controller furloughs. Look, there's no reason for that. There's no reason for that. And so I want the public to know that we are putting forward a simple, straightforward, bipartisan solution that still saves the dollars we need to save but gives the simple straightforward flexibility that's necessary both within FAA and DOT if necessary to make the adjustments to make sure that those flights are on time for the traveling public. I called Secretary LaHood yesterday. I said, what do you think? He said, I think that'll work fine. Great. Let's work. Talk to the airlines, the airline association. We talked to the FAA uh, 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 administrators uh, I said, what do you think? Air Traffic Controllers Union, what do you think? They all seem to say, hey, common sense, simple, straightforward. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's make sure we solve problems for the American public. They need to know that not only are their flights safe, they need to know that they're dependable. They need to know when they show up at the airport that that airplane is going to leave when they expect it to go. It's important for our families. It's important for businesses. It's important for the economy of this country, and it's easily solved. So let's do it. I ask my colleagues to join me in this legislation. And, uh, Madam President, I thank you, and I, uh, at this point, yield the floor. Madam President, I would note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
parliamentary situation. We're in a quorum call. Uh, I ask consent to call the quorum be dispensed with. Without objection. And, uh, and now what is the parliamentary situation? Says it is in a period of morning business. I thank the distinguished presiding officer. Uh, Madam President, I will be speaking uh, shortly on, uh, on matters of the immigration hearings. I just wanted to report to the Senate that uh, since February, the Senate Judiciary Committee has had six hearings on immigration. And uh, we concluded the last one yesterday with the testimony of Secretary Janet Napolitano. And in all, we've had dozens of hearings, dozens of hearings on immigration in the last two, uh, last couple of years. Uh, but these six were especially important for, uh, for the Senate, for our work in the uh, Judiciary Committee. I have, um, uh, tomorrow we will put on the Judiciary Committee agenda the, uh, the immigration bill under our normal practice. I have consulted with the uh, ranking member. We both agree on this. The uh, bill will be put over until the first Thursday that we come back. It's from our uh, early May break. This actually works well because um, I would assume that all members of the committee have read it. Certainly we've had plenty of people who have testified, a dozen or more people have testified have all read it and spoken about it, for or against it. But uh, it will allow other senators who are not on the committee time to read the bill. Once we start marking it up and, and voting on a committee, it would be my intention to uh, not go Thursday to Thursday, but to go um, uh, every, uh, to, go, to go several days a week. Uh, I don't think, I'm, I'm told that um, uh, people do not intend to um, delay for the sake of delay, and I hope that is, uh, that is so. And um, this is too important an issue. And Madam President, I suggest the absent quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Senator from Vermont. I ask consent the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Madam President, I ask that a statement of mine uh, regarding uh, Jane Kelly of Iowa to the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit be included in the record as though read. Without objection. And Madam President, to go back uh, earlier this morning, I spoke of the uh, immigration hearings we've held and how important they, um, they are, I believe, not only to the Senate, but to the, the country. It's been an extraordinary series of hearings. Forty-two witnesses uh, spoke about the need for meaningful immigration reform. And I believe there is a chance to have real immigration reform, not bits and pieces around the corner, but the kind of comprehensive immigration reform that our great and wonderful country deserves, a country where each one of us uh, are either children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren of immigrants, a uh, country where uh, the major Fortune 500 companies, a large percentage of them, begun by immigrants. We heard from dreamers and farmers, business people, religious leaders, economists, government officials, practitioners, law enforcement advocates, and others. We heard from those who oppose comprehensive immigration reform. We heard from those who support it. 
since the bipartisan legislation was introduced a week ago, we filed three days of hearing with live testimony from 26 witnesses. I've accommodated many member requests. I've worked with Ranking Member Grassley to ensure that all viewpoints uh, were heard. In fact, no witness he suggested was denied the opportunity to appear and testify. I think we all realize, whether Republicans or Democrats, no matter how we may vote, we should have a clear record. I asked uh, Secretary Napolitano to return to testify the second time in a couple months, as she had in February. She was scheduled last week with the horrific uh, circumstances in Boston. Of course, we all understood, all of us, why she had to cancel that appearance. But she came yesterday and answered every single question everybody had. Now, as I said earlier, when we meet tomorrow, uh, the right will be exercised under our rule to hold over the immigration reform bill uh, for a week. Again, I've discussed this with Senator Grassley, and I, I think we both agree that that's a wise thing to do, to hold it over and give people that extra time. The following week, we're not in session, but then we decide to mark up the legislation in May. By that time, the, the legislation and all the testimony will have been publicly available for three weeks. Everybody will have had a chance to see it. Uh, we streamed live all the hearings. All of this is on the uh, Judiciary Committee website. And everybody will have had a chance to see it before we vote on it. We're considering amendments offered to it. And Madam President, I ask consent that without this interrupting my speech, I'd be allowed to continue uh, for five minutes more on this subject. Is there objection? Is there objection? Without objection. Without objection. The legislative proposal we are examining is a result of significant work and bipartisan.